Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 24, verses 1 to 22. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and steadily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wickedness comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy... Will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now, behold, I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house." And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Last week, when talking about Saul and David, 
Dr. Herbert mentioned Tom and Jerry. And I went, hey, that's what I wanted to talk about next week. You know, so I thought, ah, yeah, he stole my first line already, but I decided, no, man, I shall mention it anyway. Now, when we look at Saul and David, it oftentimes feels that it is really a cat and mouse situation. David first meets Saul in chapter 16, where he is taken as one of Saul's armor bearers and also a harp player. David comes into prominence when he kills Goliath in chapter 17. And then from chapter 18 onwards, we see Saul's jealousy for David slowly but surely growing. David's growing reputation fueled Saul's jealousy, which flamed into a desire to murder David. And the cat and mouse chase began. Now, if we look at the map out there, okay, actually, I even can't see it clearly. So you guys can't see the words, right? Can? Oh, okay. Now, you, you see some numbers there. So those numbers, one, two, three, four, now those are, uh, it's like the order of uh, where David was running to and where Saul was chasing him after. So you see, it actually goes quite a wide area. And we are actually, so we have actually looked at all these places from the time we started First Samuel. But right now, we are at number 11, you know, around that area. Okay, so that we are going from 11, then we are going to go to 12, and then go on to 13. So in chapter 23, David had just used his force of 600 men to free the Kelahites from Philistine oppression after Saul refused to help them. We saw this last week. And then when Saul heard that David was with the Kayla Heights, he decided to go there because he wanted to capture Saul. And so, but David managed to escape. And while hiding in Horesh, in the desert of Zip, the Ziphites betrayed David in an effort to curry favor with Saul. Just when it seemed that Saul was going to capture David, Saul got news. The Philistines are attacking you in another place. So Saul couldn't go after one man, right? He had to protect his kingdom. So he left the chase and he went to wherever it is, the war with the Philistine was. But Saul's jealousy and anger never let him go. And so after he had fought the Philistines, he resumed his pursuit of David as soon as he could with his 3,000 chosen men. On the run again, David and his men went to a place called En Gedi, an oasis on the western shore of the Dead Sea. There, the barren mountains rise almost straight up from the shore. The mountains are limestone mountains, laced with steep ravines, honeycombed with caverns, where wild goats are on the mountainside. It was an ideal hideout for a man running from the law. David and his men found a cave large enough for 600 men. So it's not a small, coochie cave, okay? It's a really big cave for 600 men. And they were hiding in all the angles and the passageways, way back from the entrance. And so we come to 1 Samuel chapter 24, which is the passage we are going to cover today. Let's pray. Truly, Lord, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And Father, we are reminded today that you are the Lord who is sovereign over all. As we look at this passage together today, help us, Lord, to understand who you truly are. 
Enlighten us, Lord, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I watched four episodes of Inside Man on Netflix two weeks ago. And I found the episodes very entro. Have you all heard of Inside Man? Yes, okay. At least somebody said yes. Now, <laughs> I found each episode very entrolling. Surprises popping up here and there. And when the first episode ended at a cliffhanger, Rina and I, at about like one o'clock in the morning, we couldn't stop. Okay? We had to continue to the next episode to see what was going to happen. At the end, we watched all the four episodes at one go because there was just so much action and surprises. Now, 1 Samuel 24 is somewhat like the inside man. Actually, a large part of the Old Testament is like inside man. We cannot stop reading after a few chapters. And can you stop after three verses? Cannot. You just have to go on. And then you cannot stop again. You read another few verses. The sense of drama is intense. In this account, just this account, we find danger, suspense, and surprises. Please allow me to take, you, to take the liberty to dramatize this passage today. That's why it started with all these pictures. Okay? And in light of me wanting, in light of me thinking about inside man, I thought some drama would be nice. You know, Saul with his 3,000 chosen men on horses are going past this cave in the oasis in En Gedi. Suddenly, Saul says to his guys, Hey guys, I need to go. I cannot tahan anymore. No, he gets off his horse and because he just can't hold it anymore, he rushes into the cave, still wearing his royal robe. Can you imagine this long royal robe and you're about to go to the toilet? Okay, but inside the cave, David and his 600 men are hiding. Now think of yourself as one of David's men peering out of the cave, watching Saul and his army drawing nearer and nearer. And then they stop right in front of the cave where you are hiding, away from him. I can almost feel the tension as Saul's eyes turns around the whole cave looking for the right hole to rush into. And David's men are crouching very low at the back of the cave and they silently moan as they see David approaching the very cave that they are hiding in. They are outnumbered one to five because Saul has 3,000 men and David has only 600. But David and his men grasp their weapons, whatever that is, whether it's a dagger or a sword, and they are ready to defend themselves, ready to die fighting. Now, little did they know what Saul had in mind when he was rushing into that cave. Now, can you just stop here and find out, did he do his business? Did David kill him? Cannot stop, right? Must continue. So that, now we move to episode two, the next part. Now David's men can't believe it. The king has, who has been hunting for David here, there, and everywhere in the wilderness, he is entering the cave alone, unguarded. Now David's men are more at ease now. 600 pairs of eyes watch Saul easing himself. And they begin to ponder the meaning of this moment. It looks to them as though God has given them the opportunity to kill Saul. 
a prophecy is recited to David. This is your chance, David. Yahweh is giving you your hunter on a silver platter. Carpe diem, seize the moment. Just go and trust your sword into him. He will be dead, you will be king, and we will be fugitives no more. Just do it. And so David, encouraged by his men, quietly moved towards Saul. It is a large cave, so it is a long walk. Maybe it was at this time that some of the lines of Psalm 57 was inspired. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among the ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. He thinks about this as he's walking towards Saul. And then he is comforted. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory fill the earth. While David stealthily approaches Saul, Saul is so, so relieved to relieve himself. He is just letting it all go. And in that moment, his guard is most definitely down. Would you be sitting in the toilet thinking of who's going to murder you? No, right? Now, so his guard is so down that he doesn't even realize that another human being is crouching so close to him. He is so relieved to empty himself he doesn't even realize he has opened himself up to the enemy. David comes very close. He lifts part of Saul's robe, and with one hand, he lifts the sword that he was going to use. Dun, 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 dun. End of episode two. Okay, they always stop at cliffhangers, right? So that you need to go to the next part. Now, friends, but this is just four verses in 1 Samuel chapter 24, and you see how much action there has already been. You know, I tell you, the Bible has got so much drama, and it's, you can make numerous movies and TV episodes just from the stories in the Bible. It is so compelling. It is so gripping. Now, the stories are what made me read the Bible cover to cover when I was a kid. You know, I tell my kids that also. I don't understand how come you haven't read the Bible cover to cover yet at one go, you know. But I found the story so good, I just had to read it. And I find it quite difficult when there are people who tell me the Bible is boring. It's very hard to read it. You know, really, is the Bible boring? Four verses, so much action. So we move to episode three now. David did not trust his sword into Saul. Saul's head is not rolling. Blood is not flowing. David just cut off a piece of the royal robe, and he walks back to his men. As he reaches his 600 men, he looked very downcast, and he looked very troubled. David is conscience-stricken overtaking a portion of Saul's robe. His men, on the other hand, are plotting much worse things for Saul. David's success with garment cutting inspires his men to solve the problem of Saul once and for all. Saul is vulnerable at this moment. They can simply do him in. Now, this is something that they are so intent on doing that only the most forceful reaction of David can turn them from their intended course of action. At the mention of killing the king, David literally tears into his men, 
fiercely defending the life of the king and demanding that just as he would not lift his hand against the king, neither would them. At one end of the cave, David's men are looking at David in wonder, not comprehending what just happened. At the other end of the cave, Saul, so relieved, leaves the cave and walks back into the bright outside. Is David really like letting Saul walk away free? And that's the end of the third episode. You know, sometimes when I watch these thrillers, I like to pause and discuss and ask questions to the frustration of my daughters and Mr. Lee, of course. They're like, why do you have to keep asking all this? But I think this is a nice place to pause and think about the three episodes. In verse 4, we read that God had at some point said to David, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Now Saul had been pursuing David for 15 years by that time. And at some point, Paul had thrown spears at David. He sent men to kill David. And Saul himself again and again had tried to kill David and poison David's relationship with Jonathan. Saul is most definitely David's enemy. Is Saul the enemy that God said, I will give into your hands? Circumstantial evidence gave David this great opportunity to kill Saul at that moment in the wilderness. God had already anointed David via Samuel to be king. David is the king in waiting. By killing Saul, David gets rid of his greatest enemy, gets to become king, and fulfill the anointment and appointment that God had given him. Did David seize the moment? Did David seize the moment to accomplish what God had planned for him? What do you think? Yes, no? No, he didn't kill him, right? Because he was supposed to be king. He did not. He did not seize the moment to become king. He did not seize the moment to leave Saul, his enemy, in his own pool of blood, urine, and feces. He just let that go. He did not seize the moment to realize God's anointment and appointment for him. However, let me put this to you. David did seize the moment. He seized the moment in the wilderness that day for something else altogether. He seized the moment to show God and his men the condition of his heart. David's heart was full of worship and respect for Yahweh. David had every reason to get even with Saul. That man was a killer, a psycho on the throne, a malevolent madman whose fits of rage and paranoia drove him over the edge. David would be doing the whole world a favor and no one would actually blame him. But still, he didn't kill Saul. Why? Because David worshipped the Lord and respected the Lord. Saul was the Lord's anointed. David appreciated the need to respect Saul as his king and felt that he had no right to act wrongly towards the Lord's anointed. 
in cutting the corner of the royal robe, David didn't hurt Saul at all. But immediately, David felt guilty. In the ancient Near East, the garment portion of anybody made a statement about the person's social standing. A king's hem was especially ornate. It identified him as a king. Taking a portion of, royal, of Saul's royal robe could have been interpreted in those days as David suggesting that he could cut off Saul's reign just as easily. His act constituted a mild rebellion against Saul's authority. And that, to David, was contrary to God's will. To David, so long as God keeps Saul in power, to lift his hand against Saul is to lift his hand against God. So in David's eyes, he had transgressed God. And that was why David was remorseful. And that was why Saul's head was not rolling. Now, secondly, David seized that moment to show that his heart will not allow sin. David is a man who knew the scriptures. He knew the sixth commandment, thou shall not murder. So David refused the temptation to take matters into his own hands to determine his own destiny. David was determined that when he sat on the throne of Israel, it won't be because he murdered Saul, but because God got Saul out of the way. He wanted God's fingerprints on that work, not his own. And he wanted a clean conscience that comes from knowing that it was God's work. You know, sometimes when we have a promise from God, we think that we are justified in doing this small sin, white sin, just to pursue that promise. This is always wrong. God will fulfill his promise, but he will do it in his time, in his way, and in his own righteous way. And thirdly, David, at that moment, showed that his heart was full of faith in God. The sovereignty of God is one of the principal factors in David's life. God promised David, you will inherit the throne of Israel. He knew that Saul was on the way to that promise. David wanted the promise to be fulfilled. Circumstances in the cave may have been favorable for the removal of Saul from the throne and have God's promise to David fulfilled. But David's belief in the sovereignty of God kept him and he kept his men from taking control of the situation. David believed that it is the sovereign Lord who will remove Saul someday and that this was not his task that day. By not taking the opportunity to get rid of Saul, David set an example of trusting God by waiting. David knew not only how to wait on the Lord, but he also knew how to wait for the Lord. We wait on the Lord by prayer and supplication, looking for the indication of his will. You know, in Psalm 57, we see the first verses, have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. He's just waiting. 
I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. And we wait for the Lord by patience and submission, looking for the interposition of his hand. In Psalm 57, it says, They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path. So much of pain has happened. But he still waits. But they have fallen into the pit themselves. So here he sees the hand of God at play. A Bible commentary on this passage by John Murray uh, says this, those with unwavering faith, oh, this is, this is wrong, huh? those with wavering faith, those, correct, <laughs> okay, sorry, huh? so now those of you who told me this morning you look a bit nervous, correct. Un and not un also making a mess. Now, those with unwavering faith will fully commit themselves to God. They will cast all their cares upon him and they will vest all their interest in him. This is unwavering faith. But those with wavering faith will presume to take the place of God, to take everything into their own hands. David had an unwavering faith, so he just cast his cares to the Lord and he waited for the Lord to act. Okay, back to chapter 24. <laughs> Episode 4 opens with Saul walking out of the cave, unaware that a part of his robe was cut off and unaware that his life had been spared by the very one who he has been pursuing to kill. David and his men are safely hidden in the cave. All they need to do is to keep quiet and let Saul go to his men and leave. Then they can make their escape into the opposite direction. The men feel a bit relieved, but it's a different kind of relief from Saul's. Now, abandoning the efforts of self-protection, David, holding a piece of the robe remnant, stands up and goes after Saul. Emerging from the gate, from the cave, David shouts, my Lord, my King, Saul is shocked to hear his name called out from behind. He can hardly believe his ears. Is that actually David calling out to him? David's men are still in the cave, stunned by their leader's action. What on earth is David doing? They see David prostrate himself on the ground, showing his reverence for and his submission to Saul the king. They hear David calling Saul, my lord, my king, my father. And some of them think, is David on a suicide mission? The 600 men are watching Saul. Is he reaching for his sword? Is he walking back towards the prostrated David? Saul just stands there, transfixed. And David delivers his soliloquy. He appeals to King Saul, My king, set aside the things that others have told you. Give ear to my words. Compare them with my actions. And then judge my guilt or innocence for yourself. I am not seeking to defeat you, or kill you. I am not striving to gain the throne by removing you from it. Look, look, this portion of your robe that I had just cut off 
while you were relieving yourself in the cave. I could have killed you, my father, but I did not. Because you are God's anointed. Your life was in my hands and I protected you. But I did this because you are God's anointed. And I even held my men back from killing you. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hands will not touch you. Your fears are exaggerated. You are such a great man and you have such great military might. I am like a dead dog. I am a single flea. Why are you so fearful of me? David's voice grows louder and stronger as he stands up a little bit straighter. David goes on to close his argument. I have committed myself into God's care. I will leave judgment and retribution to the Almighty. I will look to God for justice. I know that he will protect me from your attacks. With this, David rests his case. Long pause. It is now time for Saul to respond, and that he does. Saul lifts up his voice, weeping, calling David, my son. It is obvious that David has spared his life. How unlike himself David is. Saul confesses that David is righteous, but he is not. As Saul's evil is met with David's Goodness, Saul acknowledges that David must indeed be his friend. Saul weeps aloud, maybe even hitting his chest while he was weeping. He acknowledges the righteousness of David's position. He calls to Yahweh to reward David for his mercy. Saul's voice drops. His sadness and regret is evident in his stooped shoulders. Saul admits that David's ascent to the throne after him is a certainty. Saul acknowledges that God is indeed taking his kingdom away from him and giving it to David. Saul looks straight into David's eyes and says, Swear to me, David, that you will not kill off my descendants. An image comes into David's mind of him and Jonathan covenanting with each other. This matter of descendants was already taken care of. Nevertheless, David swears to Saul, I will not destroy all your descendants. They look at each other for a few more seconds. Their eyes are clouded. Saul turns away and walks to his men. And David turns and walks back into the belly of the cave. That is the end of the season. And again, it's time. Yeah. The credits are rolling, but again, it's time for us to discuss a few more things and ask ourselves a few more questions. Why did David call after Saul? Again, I would say that he seized the moment to show the condition of his heart. David's heart was not vengeful. No, when someone hurts us, we naturally want to hurt, strike back. When someone does evil against us, our natural instinct is to seek revenge. But here we see David 
given the opportunity to get rid of his pursuer once for all, does it? And he still submits to Saul and expresses re respect and affection by addressing Saul sincerely as his Lord, his King and his Father. This indicates that David is not harboring any anger or unforgiveness. David's heart was in the right place, for he left retribution and vindication to the Lord. It's like what Romans chapter 12 says to us, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is returned. It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. The man with the right heart before God will recognize that God is judge and will leave the execution of vengeance and retribution to the Lord and not take matters into his own hands. And fifthly, David's heart sought to be at peace at all times. In what was his longest unbroken speech recorded in the entire Bible, David did everything possible as far as it depended on him to be at peace with Saul. By going to Saul and prostrating himself before him, David was risking his life, but he did it because he wanted to be reconciled with Saul. David was humble. David was respectful. David was passionate. And David spoke the truth about the situation. He spoke the truth about what he had done. And he spoke the truth about what Saul had done. Now that's important in order to seek reconciliation. You must speak truth into the situation. As it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Okay, the season is over, the discussion is over, but you know sometimes you like to think about it again, right? So let's recap. The unfolding of this drama in the wilderness of En Gedi displays David's godly heart at work. David's godly heart wholly worshipped and respected God. This condition of the heart did not allow him to go against God's anointed or to sin against God. David's godly heart had an unwavering faith in God. This condition of the heart enabled him to wait on God and wait for God to fulfill his promises. David's godly heart did not harbor anger or unforgiveness in his heart. And this condition of the heart allowed David not to be vengeful, but for God to vindicate him. And David's godly heart wanted to be at peace with everyone. This condition of his heart made him seek reconciliation with Saul, even at the risk of his own life. In retrospect, our passage today is not only an engrossing narrative, but it's a practical guide for cultivating a Christ-like character in ourselves. There are a few lessons that we can take home today from 1 Samuel chapter 24. Firstly, the respect for God's anointed. It is imperative for us to respect the leaders that God puts in place. Regardless of their imperfections, 
or how they may have wronged us. David acknowledges Saul as God's chosen leader. Regardless of what Saul did, Saul was a mad man. But still, the actions of David underscored the nobility of respecting God's anointed. Secondly, having a clean conscience. When David had the chance to kill Saul and he didn't take it, he displayed a fear for the Lord. He showed the value of maintaining a clean conscience before man and before God. This is a critical lesson for us today. Often, we are tempted to compromise our faith and principles. But the story underlines the importance of standing firm, showing mercy, being humble and righteous, seeking reconciliation when necessary, and ensuring our actions align with God's teachings. You know, talking about this clean conscience and and being very sure that you do have a clean conscience. Now, I'm sure all of us attempt to be in church by nine o'clock in the morning. You know, I think it's like, it, you think that it is a will of God for me to be here at nine o'clock in the morning. So all of you try to be here by nine o'clock in the morning. But for some of you who actually have more than you yourself to get ready and to come to church in the morning, you have to deal with the other people as well, right? And so what do you do? It's, you look at your watch, you are ready. It's eight o'clock in the morning. You knock on the toilet door. Oi, it's past eight already. How long more are you taking? And then you wait. After five minutes, you knock on the door again. It's almost 8.30, you know, and it takes us 15 minutes to go to church. Can you please come out now? You are lying to achieve the will of God. Just think about that. Now, the third lesson for us to take home is to have faith and trust in God. David understood that if he was destined to be king, God's timing would establish it without any help from him. This teaches us that in securing what God has promised us, we should lean on God's promises without attempting to accelerate his plans. There needs to be conviction and respect for divine providence. Our motivations and actions must be anchored in God's laws, in his love and wisdom, regardless of the circumstances. Our role is to wait, to remain faithful, patient and obedient trusting in his proven faithfulness. As we have finished watching this season and as we think about what has, the thoughts that have gone through us, maybe it's something that we can ask ourselves as well. Are there any areas in your life where you are seeking his timing and providence? How are you going to pursue God's promise in God's way? Are there areas in your life where you are tempted to compromise your faith and principles? How can you stand firm?
Are there relationships that you need to reconcile? What first step can you take towards this? Let us pray. Father, we pray that this reflection will stir our hearts and will deepen our walk with you and challenge us to be people who are faithful to you, people who are strong in our faith, strong in mercy, and always seeking to be righteous as David was. Father, you know our hearts best and you know where our heart is. We take these moments, Lord, and we take these coming days to want to see where our heart is and to reflect on where our heart should be. And we pray and ask, Father, that you will enlighten us that you will enable us and you will embolden us to change our hearts when necessary and truly for us to seek to be a man after your own heart, just as David was. We ask you this in the name of Jesus.